Uh, so yeah, when we made the strategic decision to move the game from April to holiday, it was one of those things like, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, spring is the new Christmas, which in many ways is true, because if you look at this upcoming spring season, it's freaking packed with great games, right? And the marketing of the publisher will ultimately decide who sinks and who floats, right? Uh, from that, though, it was one of those things like talking to the team about it, the team's happy to have the extra polish time and more importantly to have the ability to do a beta to make sure that this is the smoothest online launch we've had, to be honest, because Gears 2's online was a bit of a mess when we launched. So this is one of those things that uh, fate has dealt us a good hand and we're really making something good of it. Well, I think uh, when you start talking about features we've rolled into Gears 2 that are then going to sneak their way into Gears 3, it's one of those things that we have a live bed of gamers playing the game every single day. And to be able to roll something out in Gears 2 and just see what works, what sticks, what doesn't work, you know, deal with uh, the fallout in the forums as far as change to shotgun spread and things like that to kind of test it out, right? And then it's kind of like doing a, a, a mini beta for sorts, right? And we're big fans of iterations, so if there's a game out there that we can noodle on and iterate on while we're working on the next generation of things as far as Gears 3, why not? And it's uh, proved to be very successful for us. <laughs> so the biggest thing, of course, we're doing with Gears of War 3 to avoid the issues we have on the online launch of Gears 2 is, of course, having a beta. Right? It's one of those things that gamers, if you were to ask your average Gears fan, what do you want? They're like, a beta, beta, beta. It's like, okay, you got it. We know we have time now. We can do it, which is great. The betas are amazing because what it allows gamers to do is kind of create this VIP status where they get on it and they get to play it and they kind of have that preview. It's kind of like, you know, engaging the hardcore at Comic-Con and things like that. And then from there, they get to be beta testers and help us find things that suss out issues so that day one, the online launch goes incredibly smoothly. That said, we support our products and Gears 2's launch may have been a bit of a mess, but at the same time, uh, we've continued to tweak and refine the online experience so that six title updates later, you know, players play it online and they have a blast with it. Well, ideally, as a developer, you hope that you would never have to have a title update, but as we know, there's games that can't, like, I got Dead Rising 2, and, like, it's been out for a day, and it's like, this game needs an update. I'm like, wow, really? They found something already? Fair enough, that's part of video game development, right? We hope that we catch all the bugs. Some may come through. Um, but at the same time, post-launch support, I think, is crucial. Uh, you know, having cool DLC that hits after a certain point. We haven't announced it yet, but there probably will be some. At the same time, having uh, events, right? So we have, like, Ticker Tuesday and Triple XP Fridays and things like that, and having a calendar linked right off the main menu that when it updates it put a little, little exclamation mark there and gamers know hey you might not want to trade that disc in because there's some more cool events coming along the way and we're essentially the dungeon masters for the online gears experience the biggest mistake that you can make as a developer right now would be to make a game that's like a six hour experience that has no multiplayer because what happens is gamers would like i'll rent it or i'll just buy it used or i'll pick it up you don't want gamers to date your game, you want them to marry your game. And the more positive reinforcement you can use to do that, the better. I mean, everybody in the industry is trying to figure out right now what to do as far as how can we mitigate used game sales and we're gonna have online passes and all this stuff. Right now, for the foreseeable future, we're just gonna keep providing cool stuff and keep gamers playing Gears and hope they never want to sell it back. I think if you have a, uh, in the instance of Alan Wake, which was a fantastic game that unfortunately wound up going up against the juggernaut that was Red Dead, and if you told me five years ago that an open world western game would have sold five, six, seven million copies, I would have told you you were on crack. But to be fair, you know, starting to get that genre and appreciating like the good, the bad, and the ugly, I can absolutely see what's fun about it. Besides, riding a horse and shooting birds is always fun. Uh, in the case of Alan Wake and horror games and things like that, I don't think it would make sense to just tack a multiplayer on a game like Alan Wake. But that said, there's also all sorts of other creative things you could do with that type of genre to keep players coming back to your game or to keep it going, with, be it episodic content or asynchronous co-op like Demon's Souls and all sorts of cool stuff you could do that way. Well, we're hoping with if you haven't played a Gears game before that this is the first Gears game you check out. We would certainly love Gears or any shooter player to play the previous titles. That said, if you haven't played a Gears game before, give this one a go. From the campaign, what we're going to have is a previously on Gears of War. So you basically are up to speed, as any given television show would do. If you haven't watched, I didn't watch seasons 2 and 3 of Dexter, but I picked up on season 4 and I was able to enjoy it because of that kind of stuff, right? At the same time, in the multiplayer, we want it to be a lot more accessible, so it's not just, Welcome to the world of Gears, here's a shotgun to the face, wait 3 minutes to play again and have that happen again. Team Death match helps reduce that so you can just keep jumping in and out and killing some fools right we also have uh, this thing that we're calling beginner assistance it sounds scary at first and it might be a little controversial but what we're doing is we're going to detect if you have any gears achievements at all if you ever really played gears you don't get this but if you're new to the franchise and new to the game you get a little bit of help as far as a little bit of health a little bit of damage so the first 10 kills that you get are actually a little bit easier for you so you can kind of get a taste of what it feels like for the crunchy gears combat to take people out and then after that point the training wheels are off and hopefully you've picked the game up and you can kick butt with the rest of them
Well, usually if you the shooter cycle is the first game comes out and it does some cool new stuff and it becomes a hit. Then the sequel comes out and it's just more stuff, right? The whole that classic bigger batter phrase that I used to use that's completely entirely played out. With the third game, it's more about refinement. And yes, there's new features, there's all this awesome new stuff, but we're consolidating certain game types, right? We used to have submission where you go try and capture an AI. Now that's capture the leader where it's actually human players playing and you're trying to take somebody's locust queen or they're trying to take Chairman Prescott, right? On top of it all, uh, adding in Team Deathmatch is a wonderful thing, but you have to be careful every time you add new game type because that could potentially exponentially increase the amount of search time for players who are doing matchmaking. You have separate buckets of players. So by consolidating previous game types and not just arbitrarily adding them, we're keeping it lean and mean but still robust at the same time. Team Deathmatch was something we looked at for Gears 1 and it didn't feel right to us. We were kind of going after that Counter-Strike model with Gears where death mattered and when you die you're out. And it works perfectly for Counter-Strike and it worked great for Gears 1 and Gears 2, but we're like, why don't we just try it, right? And we tried it and it turned out to be my personal favorite game type. And I've gone on record to say this is the most fun I've had in a multiplayer epic game since Unreal Tournament 1, which I think is fighting words, but I stand behind those words because I've been in that playtest lab and when everyone's hooting and hollering and people are shaking afterwards and that's, that's lightning in a bottle, that's magic, you can't fake that stuff. I think Team Deathmatch works better for newer players also, so they can just jump in and kill some fools, right? Um, death is less of a penalty. I imagine like tournaments will probably still want to use Execution and Warzone for their, their gameplay, where you know, you're out and you're out, which is pretty key stuff. Uh, but that said, we're surprised at how well it works. And for me, it goes back to spawning methodologies and online shooters. We put a lot of AI in there to make sure that the player gets spawned in an appropriate place so he's not just appearing right behind people. But at the same time, those little cracks that appear in certain shooters where you're able to kind of spawn behind a level 70 guy who's really good, and you as, as a David occasionally get to take out Goliath is a good thing. That's why the Unreal Tournament 1 had the Redeemer in it, right? The little guys get a win once in a while. I think uh, when you look at the multiplayer for Gears 3, we want players to, to kind of make the game sticky and keep them playing it all night long. The, my ideal situation is a guy, you know, puts the kids to bed and it's 9 o'clock at night and suddenly he looks up and it's 5 a.m. and the birds are chirping and he's like, what the hell happened? Uh, the key to that is, I think, RPG elements, and I've said in the past, the future of shooters is RPGs. We as an industry are going to collectively look back, you know, 20 years from now, we're already doing it now, and looking at what Blizzard's done with their community in World of Warcraft, and been like, God, they were so ahead of their time with all the things they did, and, you know, getting servers to crash for people lining up to pay $25 for a silly little pet. That's amazing that they've been able to do that. And so by putting in things such as an experience system, unlockables, having, a, you know, events once or maybe twice a week where we have a calendar in the game, which you're suddenly going to see in a lot of the other games, by the way, you know, exclamation mark on the title screen go to the calendar and see it's ticker Tuesday or it's triple XP Friday and you, you create that online experience where players envy the other guy who has the thrash ball coal outfit and suddenly they have an extra reason to stay online and to kind of earn stuff and to play it for until the wee hours of the morning and then potentially not change and not trade their game in the current state of game journalism is a topic I could talk about extensively for many, many hours. Uh, for every great journalist out there who writes a legitimate story and is very fair, uh, there is a blogger who just posts something to cause a flame war to pop up on a video game aggregate site, right? We're in a world where impressions and hits are money. And if somebody can profit by saying, like for instance I say, you know, I think Alan Wake was a great game and uh, you know, if the, maybe if there was an online component it would have helped it a little bit more as far as going against Red Dead. And then they take that out of context and says, uh, Cliff says Alan Wake sucked or something like that. I'm like, I, it's not exactly what I said. And so what happens is words get re reused for somebody's agenda. The key for us as creatives working with PR people and everything is to just not work with those people. Like if you're going to take our words and twist it, then you don't get to see the cool new stuff. I, you can criticize me all you want. I've said dumb stuff in the past. You know, Gears 2 Online was a bit of a mess at launch, you know, and Unreal 2 didn't do well. I mean, I've certainly made my mistakes, but more importantly, we learn from our mistakes and we look to work with the journalists who are legit and, and you know, kind of hold the, hold the torch. Yeah, I think the uh, Unreal franchise right now is kind of on uh, cryo sleep for the time being. But um, well, you know, who knows? I mean, we're, our hands are full. I mean, we could, you know, we're still hiring, and we could use people, you know, with Gears and Boldstorm, and then we have uh, Project Sword, which was announced for Apple devices coming out this holiday. We we have our our cup runneth over. But you know, I, somewhere down the line, way if we ever have time, it'd be great to resurrect Unreal One. I think that'd be cool. Do like a Fallout Three type of thing. Spicy chicken's a motherfucker.